hello everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Kukum Weekly. Joining us this week is Chade Johnson, developer relations engineer at New Relic. And thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And well, she's also uh, an expert in security, cybersecurity, and especially, well, well, it looks like everything that includes the world of working with people in IT, which is really, really interesting in, uh, in my opinion, and not something we talk about enough on the show. So thank you again. Would you like to give us a quick introduction about yourself? Okay, perfect. So hello, everyone. My name is Shade C. Johnson. I'm based in Chicago, Illinois. I have a background in computer science with a concentration on cybersecurity topics, um, more specifically clandestine communication. I really um, fancy that type of stuff. Um, I'm also strongly into the health community. Um, I train for fitness competitions regionally. I create different routines for different um, fitness levels. I promote and engage myself in the plant-based lifestyle. I received the certificate in plant-based nutrition from Cornell University just to show how serious I was. And I often have tech talks and jam sessions with other technologists, particularly those that are interested in competitive programming and that are just interested in building different projects. So I try to keep myself um, as busy as possible just based off of things that I'm interested in. And that is pretty much it. I also have my dog Khalifa here. He's um, He wants to say hi. <laughs> um, oh. But yeah, but that's pretty much it. Nice. Well, uh, I mean, the uh, what I'm particularly interested in is you work with New Relic, which is a company I have been a customer of for a long time and uh, being a Rails developer. So we've used New Relic for, I will say since the, I don't want to say since the inception, but I think it's been a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've had an account for a long, long time now. And uh, well, for, so first of all, the, the main product you have is APM, which is a application monitoring platform in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you in particular, you work with, uh, well, finding and remediation vulnerabilities between New Relic. And I'm curious about how you use the platform for that, because I, I've only really used New Relic to do things like, hey, it's failing, let's fix it. Mm -hmm. So we're, uh, looking into vulnerabilities with an APM looks like it's very interesting. So I'm curious to learn about that. Yeah, so pretty much. So I joined New Relic um, in March of this year, and my very first project was creating a fast API steganography um, uh, application and so I went ahead and created that app and I connected it to the New Relic platform and I was able to monitor the performance of the entire platform just seeing how quickly certain APIs ran, how slow certain APIs were, how to find the root cause of the APIs that were performing the slowest and in terms of vulnerabilities they released a feature called vulnerability management where they scan the application's libraries, and they they compare the libraries that you have incorporated into your project with those that are found in the Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, or CVE, database, and they pretty much pinpoint the vulnerabilities that are present in your application, and they also point you to the correct um, version that you should use that doesn't have any vulnerabilities, and they also have an IAS feature, which is interactive application security testing, where they pretty much scan your application for um, different types of exposures just to make sure that your application is overall robust. So not only can you monitor like the overall performance of your application and improve those metrics, you can also scan for different security issues and threats and just make it better overall. Nice, yeah. Uh, that's always, I mean, uh, the, with the uh, inception, well, it took, I mean, it's been a while, but package based software, especially uh, the success of Node and a couple other scripted languages, really showed us how important it is to monitor your vulnerabilities in various levels. Because mm -hmm. honestly, it, it, they can be few levels down into dependency stack. And at some point, you just realize, hey, something's wrong. So it, uh, that's very interesting. Although you did mention one word that interests us very much. Sorry to for the U-turn, but what is steganography? Like, I generally don't know. And mm -hmm. I'm super <laughs> curious. Yeah, so steganography is pretty much the process of hiding a secret message into uh, an object. So I can hide 
um, dog in a picture and some type of um, any object. And you could, uh, so the program that I created, um, it was actually from a replit tutorial where they showed that you could enter, the user could enter in a secret message and that message would be encrypted inside of an image. And then you could unencrypt it using a decryption algorithm. Um, so yeah, and that comes from my interest in security topics. That's one of those things where I'm just like, oh, I really like steganography. Um, let me dive into this further. So that's how I discovered that. That's very interesting. And what are a few users you could think of? Like, is it secret agent type of uh, stuff or could it be more for maybe disseminating information without people being able to notice that's uh there might be a need for that in the world mm -hmm. yeah it? i'm so sorry what was the question i mean uh, what, what what's the what usage do you think steganography has what types of usage can be um it honestly could be used in any use case so if i want to send a secret message to my friends and i want it to appear as regular a regular image i would just type in to the program this message put it into the image it'll um build into the image i'll send it to my friend and as long as my friend have the decryption key or the access to the program that does the decryption for you, um, they will be able to see the message. Whereas if you were to see that picture, you would just see the regular picture. So the mission will be accomplished with the clandestine communication. Um, it could also be used in um, more extreme cases, such as in the military or government communications, if they want to send a secret message to um, soldiers or their workers, they could encrypt the message inside of in some type of image or object send it to them and only those people, those recipients will be able to actually retrieve that secret message. So it's, a de it's definitely um, good for the use cases where you want to communicate something to someone privately and you don't want anyone else from with the normal eye to capture that because it won't be revealed unless you have um, a special decryption algorithm or a program that does that for you. So compared to encrypting communications, this could provide a level of... Uh plausible deniability yeah it's just a picture <laughs> of a dog well of course if you were if you're exchanging messages and someone finds you have encrypted data in your communication channels and they cannot decrypt them they know something is going on right so they right. Will, will come and ask hey uh, you know uh why why show us what's in those messages and you you somehow have to you're you're in danger now well if you have a picture of a dog Hey, it's just photos of my dog. Like, right. <laughs> why do you care? It's really, yeah, it's really interesting. And well, as a uh, solutions architect, I, well, I came up from engineering and went to sales, but I did spend a lot of time working with developers as, you know, helping them out. So I think what's going to be very interesting about your profile for the community is how do you approach developer relationships? Developers are notoriously a very diverse bunch. There's the overly talkative ones down to the people you have to drag out of the cubicle. So it's hard to have one approach. How do mm -hmm. you approach the relationship with the developer? Yeah, so honestly, it all starts with a conversation. So I just get to know the developer. I introduce myself, get to know them, and then I ask them, what is their background? So when they tell me their background, that pretty much um, guides the conversation. So if they are DevOps, I could pretty much, if I'm, Working on behalf of New Relic, if they're DevOps, I can show them the DevOps features that they can use. If they're more so into the security engineering side, I can show them, oh, we New Relic has these security features. If they're more into networking or infrastructure, I could then point out those features. So it all starts from that conversation, getting to know the developer, getting to know their background, and just letting that lead the way. I try not to approach these conversations with the general template because, like you said, we have a diverse group of different developers and each one has a special use case and in order to relate to them properly i need to make sure that i'm understanding where they're coming from yeah i really feel like that's a i wouldn't even call it a mistake so, that sometimes companies do and thinking well our developer relationships is just going to be a bunch of blog posts go to a conference and mm -hmm. speak there and then it never, I mean, it does work for the people you almost accidentally hit as your target. Like some people like your blog post and your conference talk and they will respond. Many others will not respond at all because it doesn't work for them. 
I don't like watching video, for example. I know it sounds weird, but it's just no. <laughs> That's <laughs> part, I, I don't like watching videos either. But if I work with people that do, I just tough through it, honestly. But you are right. Um, I do have some developers within my network who are really, really into technical blog posts and. I send my blog post to them and I, you know, I, that's the way that we communicate and share different topics. We have some people that are interested in videos and then I just say, okay. And then I just watch it and I watch it with them. We discuss it. So I do try to um, switch up my approach. Yeah, it, it's necessary. Again, just putting some companies think they're done. I've done, okay, we have 20 blog posts out there. We're done. Right. <laughs> you haven't even started. Like it, that, it, it barely works sometimes. So yeah, you need a much better, much more varied approach. Speaking of which, I know you've been speaking at many conferences. So I'm curious, what what were the last few conferences you were at? What were the topics? Did you like the come the events? You recommend people going there? I always ask this because there's so many conferences on in the world right now. After you know two years where there were not much. And uh, so finding interesting events is always hard because there are so many. Yeah, there are a lot of different conferences. Um, and you're asking which ones. What are your do favorites? I yeah, where, where do you speak at and which, which are your favorites? Um, so with New Relic, the conferences that I've been frequenting are called DevOps Days. And I've been to oh. DevOps Days. So that's um, pretty much targeting developer operations engineers. But a lot of different engineers come. So I've seen engineers that work on hardware. So from Intel, we have people that work um, on infrastructure such as Puppet. And then we have like APM and observability platforms like New Relic and others. Um, my favorite, I, I like all of the DevOps days, to be honest. The very first one that I attended was um, in Denver, Colorado back in April. And I was completely confused. It was the very first one. I mm -hmm. didn't know how to approach it. I worked with my colleague. He knew his way around the space. And I just pretty much observed his interactions. And then I listened to the different conversations. And then I just kept going to the different conferences. I was the event lead in Chicago and Dallas. And those by far were my favorite so far. And that's because I kind of understood the conversations much better. I attended my very first open space where I sat around um, in a room and had a roundtable conversation with other developers and they were just talking about how they pretty much um, do different hacking things and how they secure their networks, how they use different VPNs and how they build their own home labs and different things like that. And I'm like, wow, this is really cool. I understand the different terminologies that they're using. I don't exactly know how this process works, but I like the exposure. And after that, I went back and I talked to my friends who are heavily into that too. And we just pretty much had a knowledge sharing session. I'm like, yeah, these are the conferences that you want to be at. And uh, recently I went to Indianapolis DevOps Days. And there I, because I have an interest in security, um, I had met another guy um, who gave a talk. In, he's based in Chicago and his specialty is security. And that inspired me to um, host an open space, just talking about different security topics, talking about how... Um, how do you approach security at your company? How do you secure your applications? What testing tools do you use? Do you use New Relic? Do you use Sneak? Do you use um, SonarQ? Do you use those different tools? And um, how are you ensuring those best practices are, be are taking place? And uh, that by far was my favorite um, topic because it was also my first time hosting an open space. So not only I went all the way from, okay, not knowing what was going on in this space, to understanding the terminology and attending my very first open space to hosting my own open space where people actually came and they had, you know, intellectual conversation and just did a lot of good knowledge sharing. So my favorite conferences, granted, I'm a little biased since they're mostly the ones that I've been going to are DevOps days. So, well, but I do yeah. look forward to going to like, you know, AWS conferences in the future, like reInvent or going to Apple's, you know, WWDC. I really have an interest in attending all the developer conferences that I can, especially with the bigger companies too. Yeah, that's uh, you're right. Well, I, I I've never been to a DevOps stage uh, conference, but I think I should join. It's uh, really yeah. Cool. I as an architect, I end up having to deal with DevOps at least as a you know high level basis. So it's really it is mm -hmm. really interesting. Well, as a security expert, well let's let's start let's have a discussion about what people can learn. 
uh, you are a, a security expert, but you're also a developer and do developer relationship. I know a lot of developers who don't have much knowledge in security. Like they just mm -hmm. don't either care or never were trained. If I'm a developer and I feel like I don't know much about security, where do you say someone should start learning? Okay, yes. So I'm not sure if you or the audience is familiar with um, David Malin from CS50. He no, has... I'll look him up. Yeah, he's a, um, a pretty famous professor in the computer science community. Um, he teaches at Harvard and he hosts his courses on, I don't know, he, uh, I think it's a lot of places, but right. I use EDX in particular to watch his introduction to cybersecurity. And that particular course is only five weeks and you can learn about cybersecurity practices from the software level, securing networks, all of that good stuff. And it's um, targeted for both technical and non-technical users. So I, I recently started that because it just opened up and I feel like it's a very great refresher for those who are trying to stay abreast with their security stuff because he's pretty much in the field now and he's making sure that his content is relevant, but it's also a good intro to those who have no idea where to start. He um, goes into the deep into the code. I kind of skipped around to what I needed to, you know, brush up on for certain conferences and just to have conversations. But he does go deep into the code and he show you how um, different attacks can happen and how you can protect yourself. So I do think that is a great, great, great resource to get started and to refresh yourself. And also you could just... Um, just stay up to date with the news. So I follow a community called, I'm not exactly sure um, what the name is, but it's some type of cyber hub on LinkedIn. They post different um, security vulnerabilities, uh, cyber jokes, and just different topics that you should know to keep yourself secure. They recently talked about or posted articles on quishing, which could be QR phishing or some type of hack where um, malicious users or actors, they would post a QR code that ha that redirects to a malicious link. And you wouldn't know because, you know, we're in an era where, oh, just scan this QR code. Yeah. So you will go ahead and scan it and you would think that you're going to one place, but you're really going to like a dummy site or a site that's collecting your information. So definitely follow security channels. Uh, wow, try that to would be so news. easy to do. That's... Uh, yeah, that's nefarious. Like it will be super yes. easy to do. Plus, yeah. phones don't have the full UI that normal that the desktop browser has. So mm -hmm. it will be very hard to notice you're not on the right website. It will yeah. wear a clone website. So it looks like it's Bank of America, but it's uh, it's not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Wow. Exactly. Yeah, that's, and plus, yeah, you're right. I'd never thought of it. Like you could walk around. QR codes are usually stuck to something. So if you mm -hmm. print them in thin enough paper, you can just stick the QR code on top of the original and you will notice because some of them are a bit frayed with usage or not always super clear. And yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm yep. going to pull this at some conference and go. Back. <laughs> yeah. And see, and with that said, that's why it's always good to just have this defensive um, mindset whenever you approach anything like don't go clicking any links. If you don't like I would rather if someone sends me a link, I would rather them have them to send me a screenshot, give me the TLDR version of what what are you sending me? Or I will type it in myself, analyze the URL just to make sure that I'm not, you know, exposing myself. We um, we do that as almost a company policy. I'm mm -hmm. as amongst other things, I'm leading the SOC2 certification initiative internally. And the platform we use occasionally sends out links that ask for people to approve a policy. You know, every mm -hmm. time you change the policy, approve a policy or perform some security training. We always, we have a policy where I just go on a company Slack and let everybody know there is an email coming from the platform saying that you should approve the policy. That is a real email. Go right. ahead and click on it. Otherwise, people will ignore by default which can be annoying to some people, but it's much easier than having to figure out what happened once you had a breach. Right, right. That's true. It's, it's, it's definitely better to be proactive than reactive. So Yeah, unfortunately, that does bring a little bit more work, but it's uh, yeah. always a... Uh, and well, which conference are you going to be to in the future so we can come meet you? 
<laughs> Which conference am I going to? Yeah. Um, so I actually don't have any conferences planned in the near future. I just Indianapolis was the um, last one of this year that I was scheduled for. But I am looking to I'm somehow, some way I want to find myself at AWS reInvent either this year or oh, next man. year. I really want to go and I want to somehow find out how to go to Apple's worldwide developer conference. Like those are the two conferences that are at, are at the top of my list um, next. So, yeah. Well, I have to recommend two conferences. One, of course, is KubeCon. We organize it in August in Chicago. You're from the area. So yes. Uh, if you <laughs> Come see us. Come okay. see us next year. We'll be we'll be there at the, at the Drake in August. I think it's from the 15th to the 17th. Okay. And well, people need a ticket. There's an early bird sale right now, but that's I mean that's the date. So just come say hello. We'll be there. Okay. And uh, the other thing I always recommend people to go to find your way to Fosdem in Brussels, Belgium, once in your life. Okay. It, it, it's a massive a conference. It's fifteen thousand. Old school wow. hackers descending on a university town, uh -huh. and there's people with laptops sitting everywhere for for a weekend, like literally just sitting everywhere. And you want your your laptop to be up to date and have a firewall ready because mm -hmm. otherwise horrible things happen all the time. And it's just brilliant. It's just people. It's almost self organized. Like aside from the spaces where mm -hmm. the uh, where the university gives you access, then the rest is completely self-organized. Like people invite their own speakers. It's very, very interesting. It also has people drinking beer at 9 a.m. So it's, it's Belgium. It's, uh, but it's, it, it is unique. Like it's the most unique conference I've ever been to. And it's something that is effective if you're in the security area. It is really, really worth going to. It's free, by the way. So it's uh, just just go there. You show, literally just show up. You, if you uh -huh. register, the registration ticket is the price of a T-shirt, which you get. Like you, they support the the conference by selling T-shirts, so it's really, okay. it's really interesting. It's one of a kind. Like it's a, you have to experience it. Bring a firewall. Bring two, probably. Right. <laughs> and could you repeat that conference, the Just last one? Fosdem, F O S D E M, in Belgium, in Brussels. I okay. always joke that people should just wrap their computers in cling film before they come over because. <laughs> That's how <laughs> we're, seeing, we're really seeing interesting things. There's people who do experiments like stand up a Raspberry Pi with mm. an open server and see how many seconds it takes for the server to start, start getting scans or hacks. We did that with voice over IP server, first voice server once, and it took 13 seconds to start getting scans. 13 wow. seconds. So it, is, it, wow. is. it is what it is. It's really, it, it's like the, I don't know, the European version of DEF CON, I think. Okay. I was just it's, about to ask about that. Okay. Got that's you. That's organized and more spontaneous. So it's really, it's an interesting event. And I really recommend people from any, especially from the security area, but really any, I've spoken there many times. I have many friends going there. And it's, uh, it's, oh, really, nice. it's really worth going. It's uh, so, yeah, just come check it out. Of course, okay. the, uh, <laughs> Of course, uh, we have also have Glucon going on in Chicago, which mm -hmm. is also very, very fun. And what else? Uh, well, used to be Astrocon, but that's changed now. So it's, uh, it's a bit different as a, uh, as a conference. Well, okay. then, and I, I, I don't have any speaking engagements either. We have some people going to API World, I think, and someone's going to Bon Evolution next month in New York. Okay. So there's a bunch of things going on. Great. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, again, uh, Thank you for joining us. It's, uh, it's always interesting to talk about security. It's always interesting to meet someone that's enthusiastic about the topic mm -hmm. as you are. And it's really, <laughs> it's really interesting how to, well, so let's close on a different tone. Since you also are an expert in like half a dozen other fields, uh, developers <laughs> are never active enough. Mm -hmm. How do we get people to be a little bit more active? Oh, okay. So <laughs> I mean, space, specifically in this space, like all of, uh, so I am I am a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu blue belt. I've been doing well, actual purple belt now. I've been doing Jiu Jitsu for a long time. I'm just overweight mm -hmm. because I don't look at what I eat. I should, but I've, I've been doing mm -hmm. that for a long time. But I know many people would don't do anything. How do we mm -hmm. get people to start doing more activity in the in the developer space? Mm -hmm. Um, within a developer space, so I would honestly I feel like walking is the very easiest thing that mm -hmm. you can do, yeah. especially if you have the ability to do so. So when you go on breaks, instead of like going to get coffee, just try to take, or if you're going to go and get coffee, just try to take the long route there or go on 
30 minute walks, you know, in between, because not only will it give you the exercise that your body needs, it will also stimulate your mind and just clear, be very, serve as a clearing activity. And you will come back to your computer more refreshed. Um, in terms of eating, though, uh, I like to stock up on healthy snacks. So I'm not ordering food when my work schedule gets hectic. So I will eat like because I'm plant based, I will eat like plant based yogurt and I will make a yogurt bowl with like raisins or dark chocolate. Or sometimes I will put some fruit in there, something that I could do really quick and go, come back and join a meeting. Um, I feel like at developer conference, sometimes we do have a lot of carbs, a lot of unhealthy snacks. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that can contribute to the problems. So just trying to bring healthy snacks, or I would say a message to the organizers, try to invest in those snacks that are on a healthier side, because that'll, it'll not only help with our weight and our thinking, it will just, I don't, it will promote an overall healthy lifestyle. And when people see it, the developers there are hacking or working on their programs. If they see it there, they'll be more likely to take that versus to reach for something unhealthy or door dashing, you know? So just You're making right, those yeah. healthy things accessible and encouraging each other to go on walks just to start. If you have animals or a dog, go on walks with your dog and try to stay present. Like leave your phone. Um, don't look down at, you know, at different things or your devices. Just try to like be present, immerse yourself in nature because it will help with the thought process and all of that. So that's what I would recommend. I feel like the last thing you mentioned, well, uh, well, the lunch uh, as a snack trick is really good idea, but the fact of being present is mm -hmm. probably the most important part. Like I find that, so uh, again, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is grappling. So we are on the mat grappling and uh, trying yeah. to pretend kill each other. And uh, <laughs> that you cannot do that with headphones on or right, right. of course I can't check my phone where someone is trying mm -hmm. to lift my arm up. So You're it's right. really just a, it is a, uh, it's, forces you to do it but in many other sports or activities you could keep your phone on yourself you mm -hmm. could keep listening to something i will actually say don't listen to music when you're running yeah don't don't like it's cool to do and it's convenient but just unplug honestly and it, it will help with stress levels too if you're always connected to your device and just always have different noises interrupting your thought process then it's you might as well just not go on the walk you know so just use that time to take a break Unwind, yeah. unplug. I never figured out why people even find a uh, good length of finding, uh, you know, waterproof headphones so they can <laughs> when we're listening to music. Right. You're going to be in the water for a half an hour. Just go for a swim. Mm -hmm. it is, you're, you're very, very right. I mean, that really resonates with me. It's probably the, I have never consciously thought about it. And now that you make me think about it, that's super important. Like, yeah. yeah. Just, just do it. And well, again, I have an activity that forces me to do it. So I probably never know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you just... Well, thank you so much, Shadi. Thank it's you. Been, it's very great having you. And well, hope I meet you at some conference around the world. Come join us in Belgium. Come see you at the Klukon. And uh, well, if you have a web page where you post where next conferences, as soon as you go, if you have a speaking engagement, let us know and uh, we'll be happy to come listen to your For talk. sure. For sure. <laughs> Thanks for the invite. I really appreciate this. So thank you very much, Shade C. Johnson from New Relic, Developer Relations Advocate. And for us of people, I'll see you next week. Goodbye. Bye.